if you uh, want to really see something that said, take a look at what happened. How did this happen? In a time and age with satellite imagery, drones, and the average person having more computer power and a better video camera in their pocket than all of NASA had to land on the moon for the first time, how did a 20-year-old crawl onto a roof only a football field and a half away from a former U.S. president, fire around seven rifle rounds, and come within an inch of taking his life? I don't have the answers to this question, but I do know that this was a historical moment. So let's take a look back at U.S. political assassination attempts to see if we can glean any insight into what the hell just happened. January 30th, 1835. It was a cold, rainy day in Washington, D.C. when the seventh U.S. president, Andrew Jackson, you know, the guy in the $20 bill, was making his way into the U.S. Capitol building to attend a congressional funeral. As President Jackson approached the entrance to the Capitol, a deranged man jumped out from behind a pillar and pointed a gun at him. The man was Richard Lawrence, a house painter and English immigrant who probably yelled something like, I'm the Queen of England, before firing his gun at Jackson. Lawrence had become insane from many years of inhaling toxic paint fumes. Fortunately for Andrew Jackson, the gun misfired. So, Lawrence pulled out another gun and fired again. Another misfire. At this point, Jackson raised his cane above his head to defend himself from his would-be assassin, and a group of bystanders tackled Lawrence to the ground. This would be the first ever assassination attempt on a U.S. president, and insanity would come to be a recurring factor in subsequent attacks. 30 years later, on the evening of April 14th, 1865, the next attempt on a U.S. president's life would turn out to be fatal. The Confederacy had just surrendered to the Union in the U.S. Civil War, and 16th President Abraham Lincoln, you know, the guy in the $5 bill, was attending the comedy play Our American Cousin at Ford's Theater in Washington, D.C. The play was nearing its end, and unbeknownst to him, so was President Lincoln. Famous stage actor John Wilkes Booth, a Confederacy sympathizer, crept up behind Lincoln and shot him in the back of the head. <laughs> Booth then leapt from the presidential box where Lincoln was seated onto the stage, and in true showman style, broke a leg and exited stage left through the back door. Booth was found 12 days later hiding inside a tobacco barn with a co-conspirator, where he was shot dead by Sergeant Boston Corbett. Following Lincoln's assassination, the Secret Service was founded, but to prevent counterfeiting. The Secret Service wouldn't be put in charge of protecting the president until almost 40 years and two assassination attempts later. On the morning of July 2nd, 1881, newly elected 20th President James A. Garfield, eager to begin his summer vacation, was waiting for a train to New England in the Baltimore and Potomac Railroad Station. Suddenly, he was shot in the back by a failed lawyer, theologist, and politician, Charles J. Guiteau. Guiteau had written a speech in support of former President Ulysses S. Grant's re-election for a third term. But when Garfield won the Republican nomination instead of Grant, Guiteau inserted Garfield's name into his speech, which he then recited publicly twice. When Garfield won the election, Guiteau believed his speech was the reason, and he was therefore due an office in Garfield's cabinet. Of course he didn't get it, so he decided to take his revenge. Guiteau was quickly apprehended and later hanged, but Garfield eventually succumbed to his wounds two months later. On September 6th, 1901, 25th President William McKinley was attending the Pan American Exposition World's Fair in Buffalo, New York. Hot off a term in which he led the U.S. to victory in the Spanish-American War and annexed Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam from Spain, McKinley had planned a meet-and-greet for his constituents at the Fairgrounds Temple of Music. Shortly after the event had started, McKinley reached out his hand to greet the man that would take his life, Leon Cholgos. Cholgos was an anarchist who had concealed his pistol in his jacket and covered it in a white handkerchief when he shot the president. A crowd seized the man and beat him to a pulp, and Cholgos was arrested. When asked for a motive, Cholgos pointed to his anarchist philosophy. He didn't believe anyone should be president, or in any position of authority for that matter. Cholgos was executed by electric chair three months after the attack, but not before President McKinley had succumbed to his wounds and died on September 14, 1901. The third assassination of a U.S. president resulted in the Secret Service officially being employed to protect the president, and McKinley's vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, took his place in the Oval Office. 
11 years after McKinley's death, on October 14, 1912, President Roosevelt himself was shot at. He was running for an unprecedented third term in office and on his way to give his speech in Milwaukee when a drunken man by the name of John Schrank shot him in the chest. Schrank claimed he had been visited by the ghost of William McKinley and instructed by McKinley to avenge his death by preventing Roosevelt from serving a third term and going against George Washington's tradition of only serving two terms as president. Roosevelt was saved by the folded speech manuscript and metal glasses case in his breast pocket. He went on to give a 90-minute speech with the bullet still lodged in his chest before being taken to the hospital. Teddy Roosevelt wouldn't be the only president to be shot at while trying to win re-election. 21 years later, on February 15, 1933, Theodore Roosevelt's fifth cousin and the husband of his niece, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was shot at in Miami. He had just won the presidential election in the throes of the Great Depression and was giving a speech from the backseat of a convertible when a five-foot-tall Italian bricklayer named Giuseppe Zangara stood on a metal chair and shot five shots at the president-elect. Zangara must not have seen the sign that said, you must be this tall to shoot at the president because FDR was unhurt. But four crowd members were wounded and Chicago Mayor Anton Cermak, who was standing next to Roosevelt on the baseboard of the car, was killed. Zangara blamed a hard childhood working on his father's farm for his hatred of authority figures and the rich, which caused him to take aim at the president. He died by electric chair in Florida State Prison. Well, it might not have been Theodore, but a Roosevelt did end up breaking George Washington's tradition because FDR went on to serve three terms as president and was at the start of his fourth term when he died of natural causes. His vice president, Harry S. Truman, stepped in to take his place and was then elected for his own presidency in 1948. Two years later, there was an attempt on his life at the presidential guest house on November 1st, 1950. Two Puerto Rican pro-independence radicals tried to break into Blair House across the street from the White House, where Truman was staying during White House renovations. Griselio Torresola and Oscar Collazo were stopped by the Secret Service and exchanged gunfire, leaving Collazo severely wounded and Torresola dead. But Secret Service officer Leslie Kohlfeldt died in the altercation, becoming the only Secret Service officer to ever die protecting the president from an assassination attempt. 13 years later, on November 22, 1963, John F. Kennedy was campaigning in Texas when he was assassinated in Dallas. Kennedy was shot twice while riding in the back of the presidential limousine accompanied by his wife Jacqueline, Texas Governor John Connolly, and Connolly's wife, Nellie. The first bullet hit President Kennedy in the back of the neck and exited through his throat, hitting Governor Connolly. The second bullet was a fatal headshot. The sniper who killed JFK was 24-year-old Lee Harvey Oswald, a U.S. Marine veteran. Oswald shot at Kennedy from the six-story window of a book conservatory on Kennedy's motorcade route through downtown Dallas. Oswald was a devout communist who had even defected to Russia during the height of the Cold War and ended up working in a factory in Minsk, Belarus. But eventually, Oswald got bored of Minsk and moved back to the U.S. with his Russian wife. Oswald maintained his innocence until his own death by the hands of nightclub owner Jack Ruby on live television. He's been shot. He's been shot. Hey, Oswald has been shot. Well, at least that's the official story. Kennedy's assassination has been the subject of many conspiracy theories involving the CIA, the KGB, the Mafia, Fidel Castro, and even Kennedy's own vice president, Lyndon B. Johnson. But JFK's assassination wouldn't be the only assassination attempt to spur conspiracy theories. Kennedy's own brother, Robert F. Kennedy, would also be assassinated while running in the Democratic primary in 1968. His death is also the topic of many conspiracy theories, some of which are maintained by his son, 2024 third-party candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. After Bobby Kennedy's assassination, the Secret Service was extended to presidential candidates as well as the president. Unfortunately, the Secret Service were unable to protect presidential independent party candidate George Wallace when he was shot four times and permanently paralyzed from the waist down by Arthur Bremer in 1972. Two years later, on February 22, 1974, a man with a suitcase full of gasoline hijacked a plane with the intent of crashing it into the White House. The man was Samuel Joseph Bick, 
Bick was a failed businessman who grew up in poverty in the south side of Philadelphia. After he couldn't hold down a job, was denied business loans, and divorced, Bick had hit rock bottom. And he blamed his misfortune on 37th President Richard Nixon. So Bick decided to take matters into his own hands. He crafted a gasoline bomb and drove to the Baltimore-Washington International Airport where he stormed a Delta Airlines flight with bomb in hand and a stolen Smith & Wesson revolver. After the pilots refused to take off, Bick shot them both, killing one of them. But with no flight experience, Bick was stuck in a standoff with police on the tarmac. That was until a police officer was able to shoot Bick by firing at him through the plane's exterior. Once wounded, Bick ended his own life before police could take him into custody. On September 5, 1975, 38th President Gerald Ford was walking into the California State Capitol building to meet California Governor Jerry Brown when he was confronted by a woman dressed in a red robe. Would-be assassin and Manson family cult member Lynette Alice Squeaky Fromey later claimed that she dressed in red for her opposition to Ford's environmental policies. Fromey raised a pistol at Ford and fired. The gun didn't go off. The gun was quickly confiscated, and Fromey was brought to the ground and arrested. Unhurt, President Ford continued on to his meeting with the governor. A little over two weeks later, he was shot at again in California, but this time, the gun went off. Sarah Jane Moore, a 45-year-old accountant, came within five inches of killing Ford when she shot at him from a crowd in San Francisco. Instead, she hit the side of the hotel he was exiting from. Moore and Fromey were both sentenced to life in prison, but eventually released on parole. Two months after becoming the 40th President of the United States, on March 28, 1981, Ronald Reagan was attacked while leaving the Hilton Hotel in Washington, D.C. The attacker was 25-year-old John Hinckley Jr. Hinckley was obsessed with Hollywood actress Jodie Foster after seeing her performance as a 12-year-old prostitute in the film Taxi Driver. Hinckley stylized himself after the film's protagonist, Travis Bickle, who plans to assassinate a presidential candidate in the movie. The movie's director, Martin Scorsese, says the Travis character was partly inspired by real-life attempted assassin Arthur Bremer. Remember him? Hinckley believed that if he attacked Reagan, he would win Jodie Foster's heart. So he fired six shots at President Reagan all of which missed his target. However, the last bullet Hinckley fired ricocheted off of Reagan's limousine and lodged itself into Reagan's chest. Reagan was quickly rushed to the hospital to undergo surgery, and he was able to make a speedy recovery. Hinckley Jr. would be found not guilty by reason of insanity. On October 29, 1994, a man named Francisco Martin Duran opened fire on the White House while 42nd President Bill Clinton sat inside watching a football game. He let off 29 shots before being tackled to the ground by a civilian. No one was injured from this incident, and Duran is serving a 40-year sentence. On May 10, 2005, George W. Bush was giving a speech in Tbilisi, Georgia, when Vladimir Artunian launched a live grenade onto the stage. Well, he tried to. The grenade, wrapped in a red handkerchief, hit a girl in the crowd and landed 60 feet from Bush. The handkerchief that Artunian wrapped around the grenade to conceal it ended up blocking the pin from deploying. Artunian was sentenced to life in prison. President Barack Obama has faced three times as many threats on his life as past presidents. One such threat was on the night of November 11, 2011. An Idaho man by the name of Oscar Ramiro Ortega Hernandez, who believed President Obama was the Antichrist, opened fire on the White House. He hit the White House at least seven times, but no one inside was injured. In fact, Obama wasn't even in the White House at the time. July 13, 2024. Former President Donald Trump is seeking re-election. Two days before he was due to accept the Republican nomination, Trump traveled to Butler, Pennsylvania to speak at a rally. At 5.06 p.m. that afternoon, 20-year-old Thomas Matthew Crooks is seen pacing and looking up at the roof of a building near the rally site. According to ABC News, at 5.10 p.m., Crooks is identified as a person of interest by law enforcement. CBS reports that around this time, a sniper located inside the American Glass Research Building saw Crooks holding a rangefinder, a device used to mark the distance of a shot. 
The sniper took Crook's photo and radioed in his presence to the local police command post. At around 5.52, Crook's was then seen crawling on top of the American Glass Research Building. According to CBS, it was at this time that two officers investigating the scene confronted Crook's, who pointed his rifle at one of the officers that had made it onto the roof. The officer, taking a defensive position, fell off the roof at this point. The exact timeline of what happened between this confrontation and the next 20 minutes is unclear. At 6.02 p.m., Trump took the stage. Only 10 minutes into his speech, at 6.12 p.m., shots can be heard at the rally and Trump can be seen grabbing his ear before Secret Service agents bring him to the ground and pile on top of him. The former president was struck in the ear by a bullet from an AR-15 rifle fired by Crooks. Crooks killed 50-year-old firefighter Corey Compatori in the shooting and injured two other crowd members as well. ABC reports that 26 seconds after Crooks fired his first shot, a Secret Service sniper fired off one round, killing Crooks. Once the shooter was down, Trump was rushed off the stage by Secret Service, but not before stopping to pump his fist in the air and mouth the word fight. Two days later, Trump, accompanied by a swarm of bodyguards and sporting a bandaged ear, takes the stage at the Republican National Convention in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, to accept the Republican nomination in the 2024 presidential election. The attack on Donald Trump is the first time a president has been wounded in an assassination attempt in over 40 years. With the amount of video that has been recorded during the event, it is by far the most recorded assassination attempt in US history. Yet there's still so much we don't know. The shooter's political affiliation is ambiguous. Crooks was a registered Republican who donated money to a Democrat organization. We know he was exceptionally gifted in math and science, having won an award from his school and ranking among Harvard students on his SAT scores. He appeared in a BlackRock commercial prior to the shooting. He bought a ladder and 50 rounds of ammunition on the day he shot the president. He flew a drone. But none of this tells us the motive. Classmates describe him as a quiet loner, but he worked in an elderly care facility, so it's doubtful that he completely lacked empathy. Did he have some undiagnosed underlying mental health issue, or did he just want his place in history? But forget about motive, how did the secret security allow this to happen? In the age of social media, it didn't take long for conspiracy theories to fill in the gaps of what we don't know. Now you see that figure disappear. Wait, 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 wait. Now you see that figure re-emerge. There was a two conspiracy. They even made their way to traditional media. What do you mean intentional? You know, I, I mean an intentional failure on the part of no, I wouldn't say an intentional failure on the part of but I kind of just uh, You know, I sit here and I scratch my head. And you don't want to be the conspiracist You don't want to be the person. I'm telling you because that's what, it, that's what it, it's leaning to no, I, I, So given the information provided what do you think prior to resigning? Secret Service director Kimberly Cheadle went on record saying that the roof that crook shot from was outside of the Secret Service's security perimeter and therefore under local police authority so was this just another case of incompetent local police? Or was something more sinister at play here? Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe. Oh, don't despair, you wanna shoot a president. Come on and shoot a president.